Hi folks, it's James here. Welcome to another video. Hope you're well. Just a quickie today, just going to quickly talk about uh, the time I saw Elvin Jones, uh, the great uh, American jazz drummer at Ronnie Scott's in London. <clears throat> and uh, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life, something which I just feel so pleased and honoured and thrilled to have done. Just a bit of background on it. Elvin Jones was the, uh, like I said, he was the American drummer, but he, he played, most famously, he played in John Coltrane's famous quartet. He's on this album, Love Supreme. He played with Coltrane on other albums as well. <clears throat> For example, he's on the Ballads album. And he also did a lot of work on his own, you know, in his own groups. And he was a, a true legend, a true American you know, jazz musician of the absolute highest calibre. If you want to talk about any any legendary musicians you want, you know, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis. <clears throat> okay, so he wasn't necessarily a composer like Duke Ellington, but in terms of being a musician, he was, you know, there was nobody um, that you could say uh, was technically better than him or was more of a visionary than him. He was one of the drummers who totally revolutionised bop, drumming in the 60s he kind of he introduced lots of african rhythms onto the drum set and uh played in a very heavy rumbling volcanic style which completely worked perfectly on this record this is a very kind of heavy and devotional sound on this album and jones is playing fed right into that it had a a kind of real fervency to it and uh I mean, the kind of coordination stuff he did was just something else, but the musicianly side of him is what comes across so powerfully on record. You know, you don't need to know too much about jazz rudiments or about drumming to hear just what an amazing contribution he made. I first heard the name Elvin Jones in the autobiography of John Densmore, the drummer from The Doors. I read that book. Uh, it would have been back in the early 90s and I was just starting to learn to play the drums and I was looking for influences and, you know, looking to hear interesting names. And he, uh, in the book, John Densmore describes one evening when he went to see a jazz gig, I think it was in uh, California somewhere, and he said Elvin Jones was there and he, he said it was such a thrill because even back then in the 60s, Elvin had been a legend and the description he gave in the book has always stuck by me. You know, he says... Something like, you know, it was amazing to be sat just six feet away from Elvin as he grunted and sweated his way through all these Afro-Caribbean rhythms. At the time I knew nothing about Elvin Jones at all, but it did make me want to grab this record and then I started to read about him and to hear some of the recordings and, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of jazz, you know, this is the Sgt Pepper of jazz, it's the dark side of the moon. The musicians on this album, to me, are as legendary as the Beatles or as Pink Floyd, you know, it's just, it's one of those deeply kind of mystical studio outfits, you know, they're kind of, their names are writ large in legend and they reverberate through the years. Now, years later, it was in the mid to late 90s, maybe a little bit afterwards actually, I uh, heard that Elvin Jones was coming to London to do a couple of nights residency at Ronnie Scott's. Now, I'd never been to Ronnie Scott's, I'd never seen Elvin Jones, and I made a calculation in my head. I looked, it's amazing to think, I, I looked and went to find out how old Elvin Jones was, and I established that he was, uh, you know, not a spring chicken anymore. I don't remember the exact age he was, but it was, it was a big age, and I thought this could well be the last time I ever get to see him. So I booked a ticket, I went down to London and went to Ronnie Scott's, first time I'd ever been to that legendary venue, incredible experience walking through that door, just thinking about just the history that had been there, you know, so many people had played there, it's absolute, 
you know, an absolute mecca. It was like going to the original cavern in, in uh, Liverpool. Not that you can do that anymore because the cavern that's there now is an imitation building. But the but Ronnie Scott's, as far as I'm aware, it, it, you know, it's always been the same venue. And just to walk in, it was just a classic kind of place. You know, you kind of give your coat in at the cloakroom and they give you a ticket and then you go through. And it was it was amazing. It was all sort of cabaret seats. So you were all sat around in tables and uh, there was a support band. I don't remember too much about the support band. And then Elvin came on with his band and it was incredible. I mean, I was sat, I don't know, I was, I think I was sat virtually in the front row. It was tables, you know, but I mean, I was really, really near to him. And it really, it was a strange moment because it made me think of the John Densmore book. I was thinking, you know, John, when John Densmore saw Elvin Jones and this Californian club back in the day, but you know, back in the sixties, I wasn't even born. And you know, Densmore describes Elvin in that in that wonderful passage. You know, was grunting and sweating his way through all these Afro-Caribbean rhythms, and then here was me suddenly and sat there, literally watching Elvin do that. And he was in great form. I mean, he was he was obviously uh, transported by the music. He was sweating. He was grunting. He was just totally, totally into it. An elderly man playing very ambitious music. Uh, quite free, uh, but v I mean, you know, clearly very, very percussive and rhythmical. He had an amazing pianist. I can't remember the name of the pianist. I'll put it down below. The pianist was incredible. And I remember when he went off stage for the interval, I reached over and shook his hand. I couldn't shake Elvin's hand. He was behind his kit. Uh, but I shook the pianist's hand. And Elvin, in fact, <clears throat> he was there with his wife, who I think at the time was his manager, and I remember seeing her kind of, you know, just towards the back of the stage, I could see her there, she was looking after him, but it was just so amazing to be in the presence of Elvin Jones, you know, the man who had played on A Love Supreme, and I remember looking up, and there was like a kind of raised area with some other tables, and I noticed, sat at a table on this raised area was um, Alan White, the drummer from Oasis, who was in Oasis at the time, he was sat there with, uh, I, I assume, his wife, and he had a bottle of uh, champagne on the table in a champagne cooler. And it made me wonder, looking around, I wonder how many other, you know, big famous drummers are here tonight. It was quite good that he'd come to see Elvin, you know, because Elvin was jazz royalty, really. Now, the one bad thing about the whole experience for me was that jazz, jazz sets at Ronnie Scott's don't get underway until quite late. I think Elvin came on at about 10 o'clock at night, and I had to catch the last underground train back to Golders Green where I was staying. I was staying with a friend so I couldn't I couldn't catch the second set but it was still incredible to have seen him and the most amazing thing about the story is is that it really wasn't long after that that Elvin died you know it was the last time he played in England so my my calculation initially had been absolutely correct on my gut instinct telling me to go and see him you know before it was too late but it was just amazing an amazing experience. I have seen quite a few you know, famous jazz musicians, but Elvin, you know, was tops. Just, I mean, just to be sat near the drummer who had played the drums on A Love Supreme was, was really quite something. I just wish I'd met him, I suppose that's the only last thing that I, you know, could say with any regret. But apart from that, and the fact that I had to leave early, it was just an amazing experience. So I thought I'd come on and share that with you. So check out Elvin Jones. If you don't know this album, this is the best place to start. And he has, a, like I said, he has a big wide catalogue of music, not, not all of it very affordable or accessible, uh, but it's out there. So, there we go, my little tribute to Elvin. Hope you enjoy the video. I'll catch you soon, folks. Bye-bye. Now, when I explain polyrhythmic style to a man in the moon, the poly of, of that word means many, and a rhythm, of course, so it just means many rhythms, and... Uh, so that's exactly what it is. They're coordinated rhythms.